Okay, awesome. And we are now live. Uh, well, thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. Today, we are joined by Dr. One R. Pagan to talk about his book, Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins, A Trip Through the World of Animal Intoxication. Dr. One R. Pagan is a husband and a father, as well as a biology professor, scientist, blogger, podcaster, avid reader, and author. He has published original work in various scientific journals. He holds an undergraduate degree in natural sciences and a master's degree in biochemistry, both from the University of Puerto Rico, and a doctorate in pharmacology with an emphasis in neurobiology from Cornell University. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of the other upcoming events we have at our bookstore. Um, every Tuesday at 10 a.m., we have our weekly breakfast club, which is located at the coffee shop um, directly across from our first floor entrance. Um, and our next one will be on December 7th. We just kind of do bookish chats and have some coffee. It's always fun. And then on Wednesday, December 8th at noon, we'll be hosting Dr. Talia Myron Schatz on this very YouTube channel to talk about her book, Your Life Depends on It, What You Can Do to Make Better Choices About Your Health. Um, and that examines how we can build better and healthier um, doctor-patient relationships, and it also seeks to help folks navigate uh, the healthcare industry, which can be confusing and overwhelming. Um, and finally, we're gonna be ending today's discussion with a 10 to 15 minute audience Q&A. So if you have any questions for Dr. Pagan, drop them in the YouTube chat box and I'll make sure they get asked. Um, and with all of that being said, I'd love if you could start by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your book um, and maybe share some passages with us. Absolutely. Well, first, uh, thank you, Salem, and thank you to all of you in the audience for having me today. Uh, I mean, it's uh, I've always been an avid bookworm, uh, as you said in the introduction, and to be on the other side of the aisle, proverbially, it's uh, surreal uh, to me. Uh, so uh, I'm a science enthusiast, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek, and with me, what you see is what you get. Uh, you will hear my enthusiasm, and it's what I love the best. I always say that I have the ver very best job in the world because I get paid, I'm expected to read about science. I'm expected to talk about science and the students have to listen to me. <laughs> so it's a it's a win-win-win situation. I also do scientific research. That's something that we can uh, touch upon because that's uh, this book was born as a direct consequence of my research. You see, my, uh, as you mentioned, my PhD is in uh, pharmacology, and I work very uh, with, a, with a strong emphasis on the brain, nervous system, uh, systems like that. In the uh, frame of mind of trying to come up with strategies to counteract abuse drugs, we're talking about nicotine, alcohol, things like that. So I work with planarians. They are flatworms. They are the, the tiny cute little things that you can cut its head off and they will regrow. They will regenerate their new, their, a new head or any other organ in the system, including their brain in, in, a, in the correct way. So one thing led to another and I kept thinking, well, if I can use planarians because they're sensitive to abuse drugs, what other animals are uh, uh, sensitive to the same drugs that we are sensitive. And as soon as I started doing the research of the book, I was having so much fun. I learned so, so very much. So one thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is that we cannot separate any animal, uh, animal drug experience from our own experience. We are, after all, uh, members of the animal kingdom. Okay. And that's one thing. The second thing is that we didn't come up with the idea of using drugs, animals did. So most likely we learned that uh, plant X was medicinal because we saw an animal chewing on it and we noticed an effect. For example, coffee, probably everyone's uh, favorite beverage of choice, okay? Uh, in many uh, interactions like tea, uh, beverages like that. Legend says that a goat herder in Ethiopia noticed that his goats got very jittery and very active when they nibbled on a certain plant. Well, lo and behold, the coffee plant. 
Okay, so in that sense, I would like to begin by reading a, a hypothetical hypothetical scenario that I mean, it's I have a very active imagination. <laughs> okay, and I'm thinking I, I thought about who was the first person who decided, well, I'm going to ferment barley and drink it as beer. Uh, okay, most likely that didn't begin as that. It began by hunger, it began by hunger. Let's suppose that a person uh, found some uh, grains, fermented grains in water and whatnot. They tasted terrible, but he or she was hungry. So that was the only thing that they could find and something may have happened. I'm gonna read. Uh, this is from page 41. And this uh, I'm trying to describe the possible scenario. The bitter taste of the fermented grain was not particularly pleasurable, but hunger eclipses virtually every other possible drug, a drive and preference. And so Glarg, Glarg is a fictitious name suggested to me by my by my editor alexa i did not get that i love the name so glark is our protagonist here glark ate it anyway and after a period period of time when his hunger has subtly subsided our hero became aware of a certain unexpected sensations there was a warm feeling both literally in the chest area and figuratively toward the world at large as well as a certain degree of not unpleasant sleepiness, sleep, sleepiness, sorry. <laughs> Later, contemplatively banging one rock against another, Glarg recalled these sensations and thought about how he might experience them again. And lo and behold, you know, alcohol drinking kind of uh, was born. We have evidence from thousands of years, cultures from thousands of years ago, uh, in archaeological diggings, uh, they analyzed the residue in uh, broken pottery, and they have found pretty much every chemical ingredient as in wine and beer, you know, beverages like that. Okay, so that's uh, one of the main ideas in that sense. It's a uh, kind of a serendipitous uh, process, uh, okay, because uh, uh, again, we will never know for sure but we can imagine, we can imagine. We can even imagine a scenario in which uh, people were cold, uh, okay? And the only kindling that they had for their fireplace was, I don't know, marijuana leaves, okay? They started burning them and the rest is history. I want to uh, clarify two things. First of all, I want to thank you for your patience with me. Uh, I am Puerto Rican, okay? I was born and raised in the island uh, until I was 35, until I went to grad school. What I'm trying to say is that when I get enthusiastic, my accent gets thicker. <laughs> and, and that's one thing that, uh, and again, if you need me to repeat something, uh, I'm game. Second, and most importantly, even though we, uh, and I describe in the book many anecdotes in a, in a funny, humorous way, in no way I'm uh, mocking or making fun of somebody addicted. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a very bad problem in society that it's horrible at so many levels. But if we learn how to deal with these uh, concepts, these ideas, it can equip us to find solutions. And I use humor a lot uh, when I'm teaching. Okay, that's uh, uh, one of the characteristics that I, that, that I, that I am like. <laughs> as it were. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, that's so like such a fascinating line of research. And I think like just in this conversation, your humor really comes across. And I think that's a great vehicle for teaching people about things. And I love that about this book. Um, thank you. About um, how long did it take uh, for you to finish this book from like, you know, initially conceiving of it to publication? Well, uh, uh, it would have been two years, uh, but it took a little longer than that for uh, essentially the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only, uh, it was from everyone's side, uh, okay? Because uh, uh, again, that's another sad thing in our society right now that has caused a lot of suffering and everything, but uh, in a lesser suffering way, as it were, 
everything got uh, postponed. Uh, mm -hmm. I was dealing, I, I was teaching online, pretty much like uh, like we are doing right now, with the difference that I didn't see anyone. I'm, I, I, I'm seeing you and I'm interacting with you. I didn't interact with anyone. I need the feedback. <laughs> and that's, yeah. uh, that was a challenge. And it was a challenge for all my students. So uh, short, short answer between two and three years. Gotcha. Um, what was your research process for this book like? Um, I mean, you have that background in pharmacology and biology, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this seems like a pretty like specific and niche area um, of study. Um, and yeah, I'd love to know like how you went about um, like gathering this information. Well, that that's a direct consequence of my scientific training mm -hmm. because I'm uh, fastidious about documenting documenting what I say. Mm -hmm. Not only because I want to make sure that somebody else didn't say it first and I don't want to appropriate any any credit. Yeah. And second, I want to give my readers correct information. Can I make mistakes? Of course I can. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, what I'm trying to, to do in the book is that everything that I that I can, I document it, usually with what we call a primary literature paper, meaning mm -hmm. a scientific paper with data, statistics, and uh, things like that, okay? Uh, ironically, one of the main characters uh, in, in the book, the, the dolphins, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that part frustrated me a bit. We can talk about it later because there's so little about it. That there's no actual scientific research about mm -hmm. it. It's just anecdotes uh, so far. I'm sure that somebody's thinking about doing research, but I haven't been able to find anything like that. Other than that, I, I was able to find so much information. And since pharmacology is kind of my thing, I had like a leg up, uh, mm -hmm. as it were, I didn't have to learn pharmacology about it. Uh, yeah. Funny thing is that I never took a zoology book in, uh, uh, course in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, my thing is biochemistry, pharmacology, neuroscience, but I love animals. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I had a lot of fun researching this book. Awesome, yeah. Um... You talk about this um, like in the beginning, I think it might even be um, like one of the chapter headings, um, but could you tell our audience the difference between a drug and a poison um, and why that distinction is important? Absolutely, it's essentially in the amount, mm. okay? Because virtually any chemical that we can ingest, even water, okay? If we ingest it in absolutely uh, high amounts, can be can poison a person, uh, okay? and several degrees of poison are going to depend on the physical makeup of the person. For example, when uh, some, somebody goes to the hospital, one of the first things that they do is that they uh, record your weight. Mm -hmm. So they can calculate the amount of medication that you can endure, okay? Age is a consideration. A, a medication that could be perfectly safe for a teenager can be harmful for an elderly person. Okay, so drug and poison are relative terms. Let's go even further. Allergies. Okay, antibiotics are one of the main blessings in humanity. And yet there's many people uh, allergic to penicillin, for instance. Okay, uh, for a person like me, uh, 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 I mean, penicillin is perfectly fine. There can be an allergic person for whom penicillin would be fatal. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. And um, would you say that, um, like in the cases that you've seen, is animal intoxication primarily uh, recreational, accidental, or medicinal? Actually, it's all three. It's all three. Because, uh, again, there's uh, we have to uh, indulge in a certain degree of speculation mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, because I don't even know what I'm thinking most of the time. <laughs> let alone what an animal is thinking, uh, uh, okay? Because there are certain philosophers, especially one, I forget the name, I always forget it, but he proposed an idea, uh, a thought experiment. What is it like to be a bat, mm. uh, uh, okay? So we perceive the world primarily through visual stimulus, visual stimuli, okay? We can hear depending on the person, we can smell depending on the person, but at least I cannot imagine how it would be to be uh, to perceive the world world by clicking and hearing echoes. Okay, 
dolphins are able to do that with actually in an organ that they have in their forehead. They call it a melon, <laughs> so that, uh, literally. And, and they use like sonar, okay? The point is that most likely animals adapted their behavior. Like they got uh, dysentery, for example. And just by chance, they uh, one animal who was sick, and I say who because in my mind, they have agency. I, I don't say it or, or they. So what, what I'm trying to say is that a, an animal who was sick will nibble on a plant because he was he was hungry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if that plant was medicinal, the animal was cured. The animal survived, and their genes could pass to the next generation. Uh, okay. So that's one thing. At some point, there may be some substances in plants and other. Uh, from other venues that can be psychoactive. For example, uh, you know, uh, wallabies, the tiny cute kangaroos in, uh, in Australia. Yeah. Okay? It's been documented that even when they have plenty of food available, they raid poppy plant uh, plantations, mm. uh, opium, uh, okay? And they, when they eat those, they start walking in circles and they, well, they're intoxicated even though there's food available elsewhere, mm. okay? So for all in, uh, I mean, I would argue very strongly that it's a recreational use. Yeah. So in addition to medicinal, sometimes it's gonna be random. Sometimes it's gonna be random. Uh, there's a, a, an idea from the book that, uh, well, the drunk flies uh, in mm -hmm. the book. Fruit flies, it's been documented, okay, without any nutritional consideration that male flies, male fruit flies, when they fail to get a female companionship, they prefer fermented fruit as huh. opposed to fresh fruit, okay? And we can joke about the person who has a broken heart and goes, uh, take a, takes a, drinks a beer or something like that. But if it's not nutritional, what is it? Uh, right. in, in fruit flies, uh, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, there's every indication that the nervous system of animals and, and ours have many things in common. Uh, so why they can have even uh, feelings and whatnot. People, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, they said, well, uh, dogs have no minds and whatnot, mm -hmm. or cats. And anybody who's ever had a dog or a cat, they, they know that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. And please stop me when I start ramp, uh, talking and talking and talking uh, because this is what I love to do. No, no, it's it's all so interesting. I love it. Thank um, you. Um, like we talked a bit about, um, you know, uh, how comparable um, a lot of like animal experience with drugs are. Um, but are are there any like highs that certain species experience that are completely foreign to us? Um, is, is that something that uh, we would even be able to really document or see? That, that's, a good, that's an excellent question. I would say that uh, I would offer an unqualified yes. There may be substances that can potentially affect animals different than us. And then we have to go back to the dolphins in the title. Okay, okay so uh, the short story about how dolphins are, were proposed to get intoxicated is that a few years ago, a documentary filmmaker crew, they were filming dolphins, a pod of dolphins underwater. And they noticed that they were passing along a puffer fish, okay? They would not eat the puffer fish. They will not kill the puffer fish, but they will nibble on it and pass it along. Now, the thing about puffer fish is that many species produce a very bad toxin called tetrodotoxin, okay? Let's put a pin on that for a second. In Japanese culture, puffer fish and related fish are eaten as a delicacy called fugu, okay? So a fugu cook needs to actually prepare fish in a very careful way, so to minimize the toxicity. There's been a lot of fatalities in that sense, okay? So that, that's another thing. The sensation that people describe when eating fugu is like a tingling sensation in the mm -hmm. mouth and tongue. Pretty much like the sensation that you feel when they put some anesthetic at the dentist. 
Okay, it just so happens that tetrodotoxin acts on the same uh, part of the nerve cells that local anesthetics act. Mm. Now, tetrodotoxin it can be fatal for humans. We have to go again that uh, to the fact that dolphins are much bigger animals than us. Maybe they can tolerate tetrodotoxin mm. uh, better than we do. Maybe they like that tingling sensation. <laughs> maybe they have yet another physiological response that that we can uh uh not relate to maybe maybe they they can see their uh sonar reflections in color i don't know hmm. but that's an that's a wonderful question nobody has ever has has, has asked me that question thank you well, yeah no well thank you for that wonderful answer <laughs> <laughs> um let's see um so uh, when animals um, struggle with drug abuse and addiction, um, how how much does that parallel with um, human struggles with addiction? Does that follow like a similar pattern of behavior? Probably, yeah. Well, actually, yes. Uh, because, for example, in the flatworms that I that I work with, the types that I work with are the ones that are uh, found in fresh water. Mm. Okay, if I put nicotine in their water leave nicotine there for a while and then i take the nicotine away the worms go ballistic mm. they start swimming like crazy they can uh, uh anchor themselves at the bottom of the dish and they can go like a cobra like looking like that they swim in a corkscrew fashion they shake okay all of those uh behaviors are reminiscent of mm. withdrawal synd uh, syndromes in humans when a person is addicted to well abuse drugs or alcohol and they uh uh they go cold turkey okay mm -hmm. they go usually they go into withdrawal which is a painful process so there's every indication based on behavioral assays that animals can undergo similar uh effects uh, as it were Certainly my worms, the worms that I work with, <laughs> the, work, the worms that I work with uh, undergo these type of things. I've seen them in the lab and I use those metrics to try to identify substances that can counteract abuse drugs. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about um, how you hope this research can help folks who are struggling with addiction. Absolutely, the, there's two aspects of it. The uh, aspect of addiction per se, and toxicity mm -hmm. okay because sometimes a person uh well sadly for example an inexperienced person who is a first time user can die from an overdose mm -hmm. and that's toxicity that has nothing to do with addiction we have uh compounds like naloxone uh, uh i think the name is narcan mm -hmm. that when people get opioid intoxication we can recover people from that uh, i mean the, it's like an antidote we yeah. don't have that for cocaine, for instance, uh, uh, okay? That's one aspect. The second aspect would be uh, the addictive process per se, which can be very complex mm -hmm. because we, don't, we just don't get addicted to chemicals. People are addicted to gambling, uh, yeah. okay? Uh, shopping, uh, bad things, <laughs> okay? Things like that. So if we learn the ner nervous system correlates of both phenomena, toxicity and addiction, there's bound to be similar mechanisms in us. And whatever we can apply to animals can potentially be extended to us. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Um, I mean, you've talked a bit about how um, like age and weight, um, you know, will influence how a person responds to a particular drug. Um, are there, um, what, why else um, might certain people respond to drugs um, in different ways or, or have like, you know, good or bad experiences with the exact same drug? Okay, yeah, uh, it's genetics, uh, mm. essentially, because we know, for example, that alcoholism tends to run in families. Uh, that, that's uh, an aspect of, the, of that. To a lesser extent, we have certain indications that other addictions are uh, well, based partly uh, on the genes. But mm -hmm. there's also the psychological uh, aspects of that, uh, because there's, there can be such a thing as physical dependence or psychological dependence, which, uh, again, that's a pet peeve that I have. 
when people say mental disease, all of it is neurological disease because there's mm -hmm. a, a physical uh, thing that happens to the nervous system. Full disclosure, believe it or not, uh, I suffer from, from chronic anxiety myself, okay? Panic attacks, the like. Sometimes when I'm teaching, uh, okay, and, and there's a reason why I'm sharing this. Mm -hmm. when, uh, my biggest class is like 250 students or so. When I'm up there at the stage, sometimes I feel like running away. I've never done it. And my students have never noticed, uh, thank heavens. What I'm trying to say to all my listeners, uh, they're your, your uh, customers, there's no shame in asking for help. There's no shame in uh, suffering for, from anxiety. Uh, if uh, I were diabetic, diabetic, for example, I wouldn't feel guilty about taking a, a insulin, okay? It's the same type of thing. The most important thing is to get help, uh, okay? So, and talk to somebody. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I know we are getting a little off topic, but this is the human aspect of uh, neurobiology. I think it is important um, for folks to recognize that because so often addiction is talked about like it's some kind of a moral failing um, when really it's it's not mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. So I, I really like that you brought that up. Thank you. Um, is there anything um, that you encountered in your research that you found especially strange or surprising or that caught you off guard? Uh, research in the book or research in my own, uh, in my own research? Um, you know, either. Um... Okay, I have a couple of things for you. <laughs> it seems to be that amphetamines can induce hallucinations in sea slugs. Huh. Okay. How on earth we can ask a sea slug whether he or she or it are is hallucinating? Okay. That's a, a very interesting uh, work piece of work. There's a behavioral response that certain sea slugs express when they are startled, they are touched by a predator or something, they jump, uh, not jump, they just swim away very fast. Okay. And scientists uh, have been able to map the nerve pathways of that particular response. Okay, so hmm. certain scientists hypothesized that since sometimes people get hallucinations with amphetamines, okay, that they could try to induce, quote unquote, hallucinations with amphetamines. And lo and behold, they, they began to get preliminary data that indicated that when they gave amphetamines to sea slug, they express that behavioral, they swim like boom, without any stimulus whatsoever. Okay, so that's suggestive of possible hallucinations, but that was not uh, proof. Then again, they went further, they, they dissected the actual nerve pathways in the brain, mm -hmm. and they were able to, re to record electrophysiologically the, when uh, nerve cells fired, in response to amphetamine, which was indistinguishable from when the uh, sea slug was hallucinating. Oh. Okay, you, you wouldn't think uh, uh, an animal would be uh, experiencing something like that. A second invertebrate, and actually probably the best example, my favorite examples are the invertebrates because they are so out of our experience. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, it stands to reason that we can, uh, a monkey will get addicted to, to, a, to a drug because, I mean, we can, but a sea slug, a planarian, and then octopuses mm. or octopi. Octo oh, I recently learned that you can say octopi, octopuses, or octopodes. They're equivalent. Oh, I haven't heard of that third one. So, <laughs> I mean, so I I'm going to say octopi because it sounds cooler, yeah. as I wrote in the book, but... Uh, you can we can use either word so octopi tend to be curmudgeons they they you're grumpy by nature mm. okay when octopi are given the drug ecstasy they get mellow <laughs> they get mellow they get more social mm. uh, uh, okay just like certain humans uh, okay so that goes to what we were talking about before about how we can extend this research on animals to humans. Mm -hmm. So the responses are, are pretty much the same. The, so I would say that virtually every example of invertebrate that I was able to research 
that that surprised me a lot yeah oh, but there's one vertebrate that surprised me too koalas mm. <laughs> koalas ever since uh darwin himself in the 1800s he got letters from people living in australia that described that they had a pet koala and they will tug on the uh, on, on the clothes of the person like okay give me give me that drink uh, okay and they will drink alcohol with pleasure and they will get drunk <laughs> they will steal the tobacco pipes from the people and they will chew on the tobacco uh, uh, okay Koalas are like stuffed animals. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't relate the, those animals with addiction. And yet, there they are. <laughs> yeah, I, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> Neither did I. I was as surprised as you are, trust me. When I began to get out of town, Darwin knew about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your favorite chapter to write? May I choose a favorite section? Yes. Okay. And if you want, I can read it for you. Oh, I would uh, love that. Okay. So uh, it's about, uh, I have three children. Okay. Uh, we have a daughter. She's 30. And we have two boys, 24 and 20. Okay. My daughter, she doesn't live. She moved out, but she lives nearby. Mm -hmm. I don't have, we don't have grandkids but we have two grandcats, <laughs> okay? And what I'm going to read you about, it's uh, how my, my daughter's name is Vanessa and uh, she has two cats and they react differently to catnip. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> let, let me find in the book, I had it marked for you. Bear with me for a second, okay. First of all, I don't know if you can see it here. These are my grandcats. Oh, they're lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She has a male and a female. The male is called Elune mm -hmm. and the female is called Elara. Okay. So the section in the book is on page two, uh, 222 and it's titled Chilling or Not with some cats. Hmm. A relatively common psychoactive substance that affects animals and one with which you are likely to be familiar is catnip. Nepeta cataria is a plant found the world over and it was used in traditional medicine as an anti-fever medication in Europe for millennia. <clears throat> Excuse me. The main active component of catnip is a compound called nepetal lactone, which is currently being investigated as a mosquito repellent, as an antimicrobial, and as an analgesic of all things. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the best known targets of catnip in general and nepetal lactone in particular are cats, big and small. Despite the aforementioned medicinal effects of uh, nepetal lactone, as far as we know, cats actively pursue and consume catnip for pure pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we, uh, let me do like a parenthesis. We don't know of any medicinal application of catnips in cats, okay? <laughs> but yet they love it. I have two grandcats. Their loving human is my daughter, Giselle Vanessa, who goes by Vanessa and is very much loved herself. Her first cat was Elune, a lovely, affectionate white and black male who nonetheless, who nonetheless looks permanently pissed thanks to a natural expression that gives the dearly departed grumpy cat a run for his money. <laughs> a few months after Elune, Vanessa adopted Elara, a sweet looking calico beauty. Alas, Elara is much, and I mean much, grumpier than Elune. Her veterinarian, Elara's, not Vanessa's, told Vanessa that the demeanor of calico females tend to be on the grumpy side in general, but as a dog person, uh, I wouldn't know. Now, the behavior of my grandcats when, in, when on catnip, it's a perfect illustration of one of the principles that we mentioned in chapter two. 
in chapter two, we talk about uh, uh, the effects on, on weight, the genetic composition, what we were talking about mm -hmm. uh, before. Upon being exposed to a catnip containing toy, Elune, the male, displays typical high as a kite behavior. He gazes at the ceiling, he looks very peaceful and softly meows from time to time as if immersed in deep philosophical thoughts. That's the male. In contrast, when Elara gets a hold of the same toy, she goes absolutely ballistic. She runs around Vanessa's apartment as if fleeing from an unseen yet obviously terrifying monster. The influence of the sex of a cat on their response to catnip is well known, as it is the influence of specific genetic variables. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the behaviors displayed by, by Elune and Elara are by no means a complete catalog of the effects of that catnip has on house cats. You see, many, and, and I mean many, types of cat species, including big cats, we're talking tigers, lions, etc. They are sensitive uh, to catnip. Okay, and there's a, 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 a funny story that it's probably uh, uh, an anecdote mm -hmm. that uh, an author described when a young tiger just, uh, sniffed catnip for the first time, he put it in a very comical way, like he jumped like six feet in the air, he turned itself and he started twirling around and then fell like a cartoon character. That's not that far, that's not that far fetched in my view. So that's one of my of my favorite sections to write because of my daughter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's wonderful. And that that's something that I've noticed, you know, growing up with cats, I think most cat owners have had like similar experiences. Yes. Um, I didn't realize the catnip affected big cats as well, though. I thought it was yes, just yes. the small ones. I um, didn't know either. I didn't know either until I did the research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, what was the most challenging aspect of writing this book? To make sure, I would say that to make sure that I'm documenting everything. Uh, uh, again, that, that was the, even though that was the most fun part for me, because I love finding information, okay? But I wanted to be as meticulous as possible, mm -hmm. okay? I am also an outlier uh, among authors, uh, because from what I've heard in many people, uh, they don't like being edited. Mm. I love being edited. Okay, children out there, listen to your editors. They know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I have to give it a, sh a shout out to Alexa and Laurel, my two editors at Bembella, because uh, I mean, I I, I did write uh, my thing, but they. But that's what editors are for. They know what they're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, and and without them, uh, I mean. Uh, the book would have been different, let's just say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are there uh, any like books or um, researchers, writers that you were looking into uh, while you were working on this that influenced you? Yes, actually, the, there is one. It's uh, Dr. Ronald Siegel. He's not with us anymore, and I would have loved to meet him. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called Intoxication. Okay, pretty much uh, like what we're talking about, but but he was uh, he did like a big survey of, of uh, aspects of intoxication in both animals and humans. Okay, now he actually proposed that the instinct or the urge to consume addictive addictive substances is as basic an instinct as hunger, reproduction, uh, drinking like uh, water, okay, mm -hmm. or even breathing. I can, I disagree with that uh, a bit, because a person can knock uh, out an addiction. Uh, okay, and the, uh, the, their life is not going to be affected, actually, it would be affected for good, mm -hmm. not for bad. Uh, okay, so, and he was an interesting character to, to, to be sure. He actually performed uh, experiments giving alcohol and the hallucinogen, hallucinogen LSD to elephants. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. He describes, and actually I saw the papers. Uh, he actually described his scientific papers and he would put uh, with his collaborators like big drums of alcohol laced uh, water and he would drive it in a, in a jeep, jeep uh, to take it to the elephants. And then they will record their responses. That takes courage. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's more dangerous than an angry bull elephant? Yeah. A drunk, angry bull elephant. <laughs> okay. And they described that when uh, elephants became aggressive, they stepped on the gas and got out of Dutch. Uh, I mean, and, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. There were some other less uh, fortunate experiments when they tried to uh, experiment on LSD with elephants their first subject actually died. Mm. Uh, it was an elephant called Tosco, but it's unclear whether he died from an LSD overdose or, or from everything they did to try to revive him. Right. Uh, because they injected like barbiturates, they, 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 put, uh, they threw everything, but they actually included in the kitchen sink uh, mm -hmm. at, at Tosco, but he died. So, uh, but that character, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, O'Brother Siegel, he, he, uh, he wrote that, uh, I mean, that was kind of the inspiration of the book, of my book, and I recognize it uh, in, in there. And I would love, to, uh, again, I would have loved to meet him. Let's see. Um, this is something that we've touched on um, a few different times throughout this conversation. Yes. Um, you know, how we're part of the animal kingdom, our relation to it, um, and how how much um, similarity there is between how we respond to substances. Um, but just kind of going back to that, um, what do you think this book has to teach us about ourselves in relation to all of that? If the book were a song, Okay, its refrain would be, we are not so different from animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that, that would be uh, one thing. Uh, second, that we can, uh, in that same line of thought, we cannot dissociate the uh, stories of animals with drugs than from our story with drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we, for, I mean, it's a virtual certainty that we learned it from them. Uh, okay. Uh, third, uh, and I'm glad you touched upon that before, that uh, addiction is not a moral disease. Uh, that, that's a, a, I loved that you describe it in that way. Uh, because I, again, it's a physiological thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as I alluded to before, you wouldn't be ashamed to have high blood pressure. Same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so and uh, the fact that can that addiction is a disease, of course, doesn't excuse us from trying to to cure it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, or from a person uh, to take responsibility to try to to cure themselves, uh, which is possible, which is possible. So uh, I would say that I mean, I've come with a with a, a new appreci appreciation for the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And from plants, when we think about plants, okay, and that's kind of how did all of this uh, uh, intoxication business started, because a tobacco plant produces nicotine, which it doesn't use for anything in their metabolism, mm -hmm. nothing, has no known role. Same with opiates, same with, same with cocaine. They were initially, people think, and rightfully so, people think that they were initially evolved as insecticides. Mm. Uh, uh, okay, so let's suppose that we have like a, 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 an agricultural pest. They start nibbling on the tobacco plant. They get in, uh, not intoxicated. They get poisoned by nicotine and they die. Mm. But the same amount of nicotine that will kill a bug us, by virtue of being way bigger, yeah. will cause psychoactive effects as opposed to uh, acute toxicity. Mm. So, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the, one of the early planarian researchers described planarians as being an endless source of fascination. Mm. And that's how I feel about animals after writing the book. 
Oh, thank you. And like, yeah, your, your enthusiasm for the subject, like absolutely comes through. And I, I love that. It's wonderful to hear somebody talk about something that they so clearly love. Thank you. Um, let's see if we have um, any audience questions. Um, now is the time to drop them. Um, but while we're waiting to see if we have um, any folks in the audience with questions, um, is there another passage of the book that you could share with us? Absolutely. Let, let me see which ones, because I, I've marked a couple. Uh, bear with me for a second. I'm, okay. Let's see. Okay, I know. Drunk bees. Hmm. Drunk bees. Okay, this is on page 152. And that section, it's titled Drunken Killer Bees and Other Tales from the Hive. In the 1950s, scientists from Brazil were studying ways to boost honey production. They came up with an approach that involved creating hybrids of European and African honeybee varieties, varieties, since while the former was, were most commonly used by beekeepers on account of their uh, being less aggressive, the latter generally produced more honey. Surely enough, the hybrids inherited the African varieties increased honey producing capacity, but unfortunately they also inherited its short fuse and genital nastiness. Mm. These hybrids are known as Africanized honeybees, and they are not known for their gentle demeanor. In fact, you may have heard uh, them referred to by their nickname, killer bees. One fine day, in a real event that yet uh, would not have been out of place in a science fiction movie, several hybrid colonies broke through quarantine, escaped, and began migrating north while going forth and multiplying. The first members of these rogue colonies were detected in the US in 1985, and there's every indication that these bees are here to stay. Mm -hmm. While the massive bee apocalypse uh, predicted by the media, when news of the escape, being, escape bees, first, uh, I love puns, uh, that, uh, and so I'll <laughs> tell you about my jokes in a moment. Oh, please. Uh, first uh, broke, has unsurprisingly not come to pass. These bees are quite aggressive and they have indeed killed people, not because their venom is specially toxic, but because of the viciousness of their attacks. They go after a perceived threat in mass, in mass and continue attacking for longer than ordinary bees. Now, Dr. Charles Abramson, which I have to thank for, uh, because he sent me a, a, a lot of his scientific papers on the topic, is a comparative psychologist at Oklahoma State University who has studied the effects of alcohol on bees with the objective of using them as an animal model for alcoholism. Mm. Who in their right mind thinks about alcoholism and bees? Scientists, <laughs> uh, that who, that's who. Okay, along with an Oklahoma collaborator, <clears throat> he set out to see what happens to Africanized bees on alcohol. Okay, the researcher's idea was that the link between alcohol consumption and aggressive behavior in humans is well established. It was hoped that using honeybees as an animal model may might shed light on various aspects related to alcoholism, including aggression. Mm. Okay, so their idea is that uh, uh, killer bees are. Uh, they have a bad temper, okay? Many people uh, who get drunk, they had a bad temper. I mean, they, they were making that link. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they decided to measure a behavior that might be linked to aggression in bees, namely the extension of their stinger, okay? So uh, bear with me for a second. If this is a bee, mm -hmm. this just happens to be my computer mouse, okay? So, uh, and... Uh, an aggressive bee, they will extend their stinger, okay? Like, okay, we're, I'm ready to attack, 
Okay. And that's the actual behavior or response that they measure. Mm. They try to measure. There's a, there's a, a story about that. So the first interaction of their experiments involved harnessing individual bees. Okay. They, they took a bee, they harnessed with a tiny uh, drop of glue, fixed them in place, and they administer the uh, alcohol or regular water with a needle, okay? Like, like allowing them to drink from the tip of the needle, okay? You, you, you froze, Salem. Are you there? Salem, are you there? I'm going to continue uh, reading just in case, but it seems that Salem, it's uh, frozen. My computer seems to be okay, but I'm, I'm going to continue. They counted the number of times the bees showed their weapon over a certain period. Africanized bees did not behave any differently than regular bees. Hello? Okay. Oh, here you are. You're muted. There seems to be a, a problem with the with the signal. Okay, oh, are you there? Are. Yes. Okay. okay. Very uh, sorry uh, about that. Glad it's that okay. we're back. It's nobody. It's nobody's fault. Uh, what did you miss? <laughs> Where should I continue? Um, let's see. Um, God, just past, um, you were talking about um, how they took a little bit of glue to stabilize the bees so they could measure um, the stingers coming out. Okay. So. Um, that's the last part that I got. Yeah. So what they did was to uh, feed the bees either water or uh, an alcohol lace uh, drink with a needle. So they, the bees would drink from the drop in the needle. And then they measured whether they extended their stinger more or not. Okay. What they found is that there was no difference between quote unquote normal bees than regular bees. Okay. So then, then they reasoned, well, to harness a bee, that can be like an, uh, an uncomfortable situation. So they decided to do something more natural, <laughs> okay? What they did was to allow, was to allow the bees to uh, drink at their leisure, and then they will dangle a piece of leather in front of the hive to entice the bees, uh, okay? And the end of the story is that in that, uh, that variation of the experimental design, the bees attacked so enthusiastically that they had to evacuate uh, several of the rooms. I'm sorry, uh, no, nobody oh, wow. was hurt. Nobody was hurt, uh, okay? <laughs> but uh, actually, the, the, <laughs> the uh, actual story is kind of funny uh, because I can see myself running like crazy from a bunch of uh, drunk, <laughs> drunk, I can see myself doing that. Okay, so that, that's another uh, anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just in the last um, few minutes that we have left, um, is there anything else that you're working on at the moment? Well, actually, what uh, I, uh, I'm trying to develop a variation of pharmacology called uh, regeneration pharmacology. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Uh, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to find is that uh, compounds that can, remember the planarians that I uh, mentioned uh, before, you cut their heads off, they will regenerate brains and everything. Imagine if we learn how to regenerate nervous systems correctly. Uh, think about a person with uh, brain damage from a car accident, a person with Alzheimer's, a person, you, you know, things like that. So. What we are trying to do in my laboratory is to try to find compounds, substances that can that can enhance regeneration, because many things can 
uh, can slow down regeneration. Anything that can kill a cell will slow down regeneration. But there's bound to be substances mm -hmm. that can enhance regeneration. And if we can uh, figure that out in planarians, uh, that potentially can be extended to humans. Yeah, that's incredible. And I, I, I can't imagine like how I would helpful so. <laughs> that I would, would be. So like the so. complete But it's based on curiosity, pure curiosity. Yeah. Great. Um, well, oh, I forgot. I, I promised oh. to tell you about my jokes in class. Oh, please do. Please tell okay. us about your jokes. So I am very adept at, at telling dad jokes in class. <laughs> okay. For a few reasons. Okay. First of all, I'm a, I'm a father and, and that's what we do. Okay. <laughs> uh, second, life is too short to be all grumpy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can get grumpy like that, but, but I try not to. Okay. But the main reason uh, why I do, I, 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 I say silly jokes in class is that we are all conditioned to a few minutes of close attention followed by distractions, mm -hmm. okay? So in my big class, 250 people, when I see a certain proportion of them who are not quite there with me, if you know what I mean, I tell a silly joke. Uh, I've been known to do a silly dance. Uh, uh, okay. They give me courtesy laughs. They give me pity smiles, but I reset their attention. So they come back to me. Mm. So that, that, that's the, the idea. And humor is a very good uh, way to teach science, particularly biology. And mm. in fact, uh, one of the courses that I teach at the university, I think, it has trained me for science communication because I teach uh, basic biological uh, science for non-majors, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to my own thing, pharmacology to nurses and everything. But biological sciences for non-majors proved to be a challenge because I got students from all over the university, philosophy, uh, finance, mm -hmm. uh, education, people who may have no interest in biology whatsoever, but they have to take the course. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I try to be an entertainer too, mm -hmm. uh, because biology is so fascinating that, and we can say it, uh, teach it in such a a, a fun way mm -hmm. that it will be a pleasure for virtually everyone, and that's right. That's what I try to do. Yeah, and I I really love that. Like I think you're not only more likely to memorize and retain the information that you're getting uh, if you're having a good absolutely. time. Um, but it, it helps um, it helps show what's interesting about the subject, you know, like it, it gives it life and meaning um, and rounds it out a bit more. So I think th that's a lovely way of teaching. Thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but, well, it was just a joy talking with you. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for I having me. It was my honor and pleasure. Yeah, and um, I'll be leaving links where you can buy um, Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins. Um, and yeah, anybody watching, if you enjoyed this conversation, please consider supporting Dr. Pagan by buying his book. No, thank you. And if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to contact me. Uh, you're going to love my my website. <laughs> it's titled Bold Scientist, bold si <laughs> boldscientist.com. Awesome. I can be contacted there for any questions whatsoever or just to geek out about science. Oh, wonderful. And I'll, I'll leave a link to your website as well, if that's all right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You, you too. Stay safe and, and uh, have a great holiday. Merry everything. Happy everything. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.